Hi, folks. Hello. Uh, my name is Dan Doffel. I'm Doug Doffel. And uh, we're here at the Fins and Feathers Fly Shop tonight to tie some of our favorite dry fly patterns. Um, we hope you enjoy it. We have uh, Tegan and Stephen Randall behind the camera uh, making us look good, which is not an easy feat. So we start, thought we'd start off with a little introduction about ourselves and then maybe talk about some tools and different techniques that, you know, might be good for some uh, new fly tires. Uh, so Doug and I were, in our earlier years, we were commercial fly tires for 13 years. Uh, we tied for many shops across the country, including shops like uh, Barry and Kathy Beck's Fishing Creek Outfitters, Hunter's Angling Supplies, Donnie Bastion's Angling Specialties, uh, Blue Ribbon Flies, uh, Mike Lawson's Henry's Fork Angler, and of course, uh, our favorite shop here in Bozeman, Fins and Feathers Fly Shop. Uh, we also did some uh, demo tying in those early years, which we really enjoyed at some of the larger Eastern fly fishing shows. Uh, Doug and I might be what some anglers might call a classic type of fly fisherman, meaning that we really are passion, passionate about chasing hatches, scrounging around looking for feeding and rising fish. And, uh, you know, we're really blessed that we get to live in Montana where we have such great rivers and some great hatches that allow us to fish in that type of a manner. Uh, Doug and I fish quite a bit and uh, in our free time we also enjoy, you know, time flies of course and uh, building rods. So with that I'll turn it over to Doug who's going to talk a little bit about some tools and some thoughts about his, about hackle and such. So, you know, with some folks that, that maybe haven't tied um, that long, you know, um, since Dan and I first started tying commercially when we were 16 years old, you know, Hackle has come a long way. Um, you know, the products that are offered by Whiting, you know, really give the tires a lot of uh, choices as far as uh, colors, um, grades, uh, types of Hackle, saddle, necks, um, hen back, hen saddle. Um, so it's, we've really come a long way with what we can tie with. You know, Dan and I have always been very, you know, passionate about tying with necks. And, you know, part of that is the fact that, you know, you can, you can uh, tie a wider range of flies. Now, if you wanted, if you really wanted to tie, you know, size 14 Hendrickson's, you could buy a whiting saddle that's strong in 14s or 16s or 12s and you'd have a lifetime supply of hackle. Um, but when you're, when you're going into your fly shop or when you're, when you're, when you're buying hackle, you know, if you can, you know, I know it's kind of hard in the, day of, in the days of the internet now, but if you can, you know, buy, buy it your, uh, in person. You know, when we're going in and, and, and looking at hackle, you know, we might pull off every neck they have and go through it. And we're trying to, um, you know, although in, in some cases it's almost like
So the audio is still going? Okay. We're well, having a little technical difficulties here. Just bear, bear, bear with, with us. Bear with us just a moment. It did shut off. Yeah, I heard it click. And then... Sorry, folks. Just bear with us for a second. Still on? Yeah, we're back. We're back. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> so, to talk a little bit about Hackle, you know, as I was saying, um, you know, we, we always try to like, we always like to buy the Hackle or, or saddles in person so we can check them out ourselves. You know, when we go in and we're looking at a, a neck like this, you know, we're, we're looking at to see you know how spongy it is because that usually is going to mean how full the neck is itself you know we're, we're pulling the neck back looking at the stem quality you know a nice thin stem is easier to wrap so then it's going to give you just a better quality dry fly you know like I said with, with the saddles you know the real uh, nice thing about tying with the saddles is you know if you're if you find a nice neck that you want to um, like I said tie for uh, Hendrickson's you can have a lifetime supply with that saddle. But they're usually only strong in just a couple sizes. So, you know, like I said, we're really blessed anymore with the, with the quality of, uh, of hackle that we are offered. And, you know, 10, 20 years is probably going to be even better, which I, mean, I can hardly imagine. But um, we we're really have a lot of good options nowadays. You know, as far as, you know, some basic uh, information about, you know, tools that we use, you know, tying with a hackle, you know, although, you know, you're going to see us tie a lot with our hands, um, but, you know, a pair of hackle pliers is, you know, very useful. And one thing that I've done with these hackle pliers is just a simple teardrop style. And the first thing I've done is actually crimp the ends here together so they're flat. And then I also glue 600 grit sandpaper on each side each side of the inside of these hackle pliers and also polish the edges and by doing that you've really got a nice pair of hackle pliers that will hold just about anything um, I mean the, 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 the sandpaper I've been using in here is probably at least five or six years old so it, it lasts quite a long time um, you know another thing you know having you know a nice pair of sharp scissors you know, we've, there's, you know, a lot of, of good scissors out there. Some of them, some of the companies now are making these higher end style scissors. Um, check them out. Uh, they'll improve your tying. Um, you know, another tool is, you know, a hair stacker. You know, we've always been very partial to these double end style hair stackers. They're very light and easy to stack with. But one thing, whatever uh, hair stacker you do use, you want to make sure it's clean. You know, so periodically we're actually taking out the tube, polishing it with um, inside and out with um, steel wool, making sure it slides very smoothly, and opening it up and also getting the gunk out of the inside of it. Very important. So, um, you know, and as far as the bobbins go, you know, these nice ceramic bobbins will give you, you know, years and years of use, uses. I've got some of these ceramic bobbins that we've been using for 25 years. So. Um, with that and you know one thing I will add about the stacker is if you are getting a little static you know I recommend just using a, a fabric sheet you know if you, you spray, spray some static guard in there over time it has a tendency to build up and make things worse but uh, something to consider okay. with that so t tonight we're going to be tying you know uh, three different dry fly patterns um, Many of these, we've been tying some of these demos for years, but for the most part, many of you have never seen some of these flies or probably never seen them. Um, they're all, some of them are variations of flies that um, some of our classic friends have, have been using um, where we've updated them a little bit. Um, some are our own. So um, the first one we're gonna tie is, is a fly, it's um, a Brandy's Caddis, which is a pattern uh, named after my wife. Um, you know, I'm going to tie a uh, size 14 all of Brandy's Caddis. And, you know, with the, the next couple of weeks, you know, here in, in Bozeman and the surrounding area, we're going to start seeing Brachycentris Caddis, which is, you know, the Mother's Day Caddis is one of the, you know, premier hatches in this area. 
um, and everybody looks forward to. We get good hatches of those on the Yellowstone, Lower Madison, Henry's Fork. Um, so this this first pattern, um, although it looks a little complicated, is actually very easy to tie. And I'm actually going to, you know, I, hopefully I don't tie it too quickly. Um, <laughs> but the one thing about this fly is it incorporates a, a, a wing made of a partridge, a partridge feather and some magic tape. You know, uh, the, the fly itself, you know, um, there's a, a pattern called Paul's Caddis, made from uh, Paul Brown, uh, an early mentor of ours, um, a, a legendary West Yellowstone angler and a Henry's Fork angler, a legendary. And, you know, his caddis um, used you know, a synthetic style material. Um, but one thing when you use synthetic materials for, especially for smaller caddis, they can be a little bit hard to tie with. Um, so this pattern uses uh, some tape, uh, a partridge feather, and um, you know, I'm going to kind of show you how. I prepare the wing first, and then we're actually going to zoom into the fly when we start tying it. So, um, but one thing I've got here is I've just got a partridge feather. This is a little bit bigger partridge feather. So for most of most tires, you know, you're not probably going to use it on, on many soft tackle unless you're tying a bigger one. So it's a perfect um, vehicle for our wing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab just some 3M magic tape. Take off a little strip of that, and I'm going to take the feather and stroke it a little bit so I get the material, get the fibers close together, and I'm going to stick it to that magic tape, just like this. And so we've got, so we've got the, say the doll side, if you will, the side that's um, facing you from the skin, um, and, the sh and the shiny side is sticking to the tape. So I'm going to take some of this Heart of Hall style um, cement. Um, but you can use any kind of lacquer. I'd, I would use a lacquer. You know, some of the rubber-based cements, when you cut the wing, it actually leaves a little um, kind of fuzzy edges, if you will. So I'm, and the nice thing about this, um, also this lacquer here, is it has a little brush in it. And I am just going to brush some of that lacquer on that feather. Now when I do this, you know, I'll, I'll usually do a couple dozen at a time. So, um, you know, saves time. Um, you know, you can, and there, you know, another thing too, because uh, what I like to do is actually use at least probably two coats of, of lacquer on there. You want the wing to be nice and firm. It's going to hold up better and fish a little bit better. Um, you know, one thing too, you know, I forgot to mention when I was going through some of the materials is, or excuse me, some of the, the, the tools, you know, Dan and I being commercial tires for a, long, a number of years, you know, whenever you start, you know, tying, you know, I, I would recommend tying at least a half a dozen or a dozen of a fly at a particular time. It allows you to um, gain some speed, gain some consistency and quality in your flies. Um, you know, tying with a nice background, you know, we've got, uh, Dan likes purple. You, know, you can also get just some, just some regular, a big piece of uh, foam. You know, this foam here, it's got a green, and then I'll, I'll actually tape a, a darker side so I can flip it back and forth, um, depending on the, you know, the contrast the fly I'm, um, I am tying. Um, you know, we always like to tie with a TV in the background. And what that does is, you know, when you're sitting there tying um, for a period of time, your eyes will get some strain unless you, you know, you refocus your eyes periodically, and that really helps. Um, and for you, Tires like us that are, you know, getting up in years, you know, having a, a some cheaters, or a visor with, with uh, you know, or, or some kind of magnifier will help, and it help with your flies that you're tying, um, and so forth. So, like I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put another second coat on this feather. And so I'll usually do, you know, a dozen or so at a time, and and um, and while Doug's doing that there you know one thing to also consider is having good lighting and you know I, I often see um, many tires using really lights that they shouldn't be using and uh, so we actually like to use two lights uh, we have one that's coming over the main fly and one that's kind of lighting up the background if you will <clears throat> and I find that uh, you know the, the bulb I like the best is actually uh, the GE reveal which is kind of a a true color bulb. Uh, they make a an LED version of it as well. I find that the LED version actually is a little harder 
on my eyes, especially if I'm tying for long periods of time. Um, but be cognizant of your lighting. You know, really make sure that you can see the fly well. And you know, if you can't see the fly, you're not going to be able to tie a good quality fly. So this is still drying a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and, and show you how I'm going to cut it. So this is a River Road um, caddis wing cutter. Um, it's made here in Montana, Hamilton, Montana, I believe. Um, this Bear with us again. We're having a little. We're good. Okay. We're good. Okay. So, so sorry about that. <laughs> so this is, like I said, this is a river run caddis cutter. This is a size 16. Um, I usually undersize the wing. I think it gives you a little bit more, a better proportion. Um, uh, of a fly. So what I'm going to do when I cut this is I'm actually just going to take the I don't know if you can see that, if you can see that the feather and just stick it on there. Okay. And I'm going to so it's got the, the top portion here where the, the I guess the V of the wing is. Do you right, the cheaters? Right in the middle. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. Right in the middle of the stem. And then I'm going to pr just press down like this, and it's going to cut that wing out, just like that. Oh, I didn't get a real good cut on that one. Probably should have waited. Yeah, I waited. Should have waited a few minutes. It's just a nice little wing here and when I tie this in I'm going to tie it in so that the tape side is uh, down so and with that I think Stephen is just going to refocus the camera here on the fly we're going to push the lights back and we're going to start tying the fly so go ahead there you go is that good you got enough Okay. Okay. So this is the Brandy's caddis. I'm just going to kind of point out a few materials. So the there is um, the body itself is um, five mil olive foam. Um, the it's got a hackle that's um, wrapped through it. We're going to tie in the wing here, and then all we're going to do is we're going to put in a grizzly and dark dun hackle in there. Um, you can certainly just, or excuse me, not a grizzly, but a, a olive and a dark dun hackle. And, um, you can certainly just use an olive hackle, but why I like to put a, a, a dark dun hackle in there, as well as sometimes, especially on the lower mass in here, the caddis fishing is typically a little bit more in the evening, and you get some of that flat light sometimes, and just that little bit of, of dark uh, dun hackle um, will allow you to see that fly just that much easier. So I'm going to go ahead and take that fly out of there and we're going to get started tying this fly. So we're going to place our hook in there. This is a size 14 dry fly hook. Okay. And I'm going to grab a few things here. And one thing I was just going to mention too with the hackles, you know, when I, you know, a lot of these they have nice, or they have, um, these little hackle gauges, you know, when I'm tying something or when we're tying something, a lot of times is we'll, you know, pre-size all, you know, the hackles and so you don't have to fumble around with that while you're tying the fly. So and we're just going to wrap our thread on the hook here. I'm going to go back to the very back of it. Like that. And what thread are you using there, Jeff? This is uh, ADOT Uni thread. Thank you. And so the hackle, this is, I usually like, for the body hackle, I like to use an undersized hackle. I think it, the fly floats a little bit better and it just looks a little bit nicer um, being tied like that. Uh, this is a dark, all, whiting dark olive. 
Um, hackle? And that's a neck hackle, isn't it? Doug? Yes, it is a neck hackle. So we're just going to. I usually like to, to when I tie my hackles, I like to do it on a clean stem. You know, some people like to have a little bit of a, a comb there. It's all personal preference. But one thing I do like to do is I always like to try to tie my ha hackle perpendicular to the hook and the um, shiny side, if you will, or the dull side facing the eye. And what By doing that... You mean the shiny side of the eye? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you have this part facing the, um, the eye. So by doing that and tying it in perpendicular to the hook, once you start wrapping it, you're wrapping it the way the hackle wants to be wound. You're not twisting the stem to wind the hackle on the hook. So and we're just going to do that and I'm going to just place the hackle there just like that. And you know I've got a little bit of stem in the back portion here and I'm just going to use my thread here and just bind that stuff down right to the hook. So you've got a very secure hackle in there. On the body we're just going to tie in a little bit of 5 mil foam, half mil foam, this is olive. Now you can use the same pattern um, tied with tan foam, um, light ginger hackle, and then a brown and, or a brown and ginger hackle, and it's a really good pattern for the adult hydrocycle, which is one of the other major um, mayfly hatches we have here in Montana. So, but, so we're just going to tie in that foam like that. And we're going to wrap it forward to just about halfway up the hook. Just like that. And trim it off. So we've got our body tied in there. Now we're just going to wind the hackle here. And this thing is so long, you're not going to have to use your hackle flyers. Just with this, with this hackle here, I might get three or four flies out of that one, one hackle. Great. It's just awesome. So we're just going to wind that forward evenly spaced. Like that. Take a couple turns to secure that to the hook. And there we go. We've got our body hackle tied in. And what? Since we're going to tie a wing over top of the body, I'm just going to trim the, the top hackle a, a little bit here and create like kind of a little V for that wing to sit in. So the next portion is we've got our we've got our wing to tie in. And what I'm going to do here, so again I'm going to tie so that the tape side is facing down. And you've, so you've got the basically the good side facing up. And I'm just going to fold this a little bit. You can even see from this, this that's just way too big for a size, even a size 14. So we're going to fold this. I'm going to trim it just a tad. Just like that. And I'm going to take my scissors and just cut it so I get a nice tie-in point. And we're going to want this that wing to stick maybe a gap length now, or, or just a little bit less of a gap length behind that. I'm just going to want a little bit of thread here. Secure that. Actually, I'm going to take just a little bit more off there so it's nice and easy to tie that in. So we've got our wing. And we're just going to tie that sucker right in there. Just like that. So at this point, we're going to grab our size 14 um, pre-measured hackles. I've got a dark dun and a dyed dark olive we're going to put in. One thing when you're tying in two feathers um, or two hackles on a dry fly is that I always like to, to t uh, start wrapping with a lot of times there's one of these that's going to have a little bit thicker of a stem. So I like to tie, um, I like to wrap the thicker stem uh, 
feather first because uh, you know your thinner the thinner fiber the thinner stem feather will wrap through the arrow just a little bit easier. So again, I like to just pull off the excess fibers there. So we've got a clean tying point on both of these feathers. And like I said, these things are so long anymore. I mean, I'm going to get a couple flies off of this. So. And again, when we tie these in, I'm going to tie them in so they are perpendicular to the hook. I'm going to leave a little bit of excess stem staying, sticking out. So we're going to wind our grizzly, or our, I say saying, keep saying grizzly, we're going to wind our olive neck first, or olive hackle first, like that, trim it, and then we're just going to take our dark done and wind it right through there like that. And here's where the value of having a nice pair of scissors comes in play. If you get some hackle that's trapped there, it allows you just to trim that stuff out real easy. So I'm just going to take a few turns there and then I'm going to just do a quick whip finish and that's our fly. Size 14 um, Brandy's caddis. I'm going to imitate the Brachycentris that it's going to be Mother's Day caddis, which is going to be here in just a week or two. So, the next fly we're going to start with is a Brown Drake soft tackle emerger. And this pattern is really, again, modified or designed from an old Paul Brown pattern. Now, Paul liked to fish the Henry's Fork with a lot of little soft tackles, you know, imitate some emerging mayflies. But, you know, a lot, you know, just regular soft tackle doesn't float very well. So, one thing he would do is tie, you know, a soft tackle. He would tie the soft tackle and um, put a little, a few, a few winds of hackle in back of that soft tackle to help that fly float in surface foam. And that's kind of what this, this pattern is, is, is um, modeled after. It has got a, a shuck, you know, being from blue ribbon flies, you know, we always like to tie shucks on our flies. Um, the rib itself is flexi floss, brown flexi floss. And the one thing about, nice thing about um, using flexi floss for ribbing, one, it floats. Put it in a glass of water, it floats. Um, and also, too, compared to using a thread, is that you know once some of those uh, thread is wet, you know blends in or loses its color or just it just doesn't stand out. This flexi floss really stands out and it gives a nice segmented look. Um, you know, so we're gonna for the for the um, body of this fly, we're just gonna use some tan dubbing. This happens to be some bleached um, Australian opossum. You can also use just some regular hares ear or hares rabbit or rabbit. Um, regular. It's got a couple hackles tied over thorax, um, a grizzly hackle and a brown hackle. And in front of that, we've got a little bit of some tan EP fibers here that gives the fly just a little bit of flotation, but also gives a little bit of visibility depending on the light condition. And then in front of that, we've got a, a whiting um, hen saddle or hen back feather. And this is a grizzly dyed straw, um, a, a grizzly dyed brown or a Grizzly dyed tan would be fine. Also, you know, in some light conditions, you know, we we'll, might even use a medium or dark dun. It just all depends. They all they all work, um, but you want to make sure even you know, this is an evening hatch, and you want to be able to make sure you can you can see the fly. Now, one real advantage um, here is you know this is you know some of these larger dry fly patterns can be easy can be hard to cast, and they land really they kind of land hard um, on the water. This fly, the way it is tied, is, is easy fly to cast, and it lands very, it, rather softly. So it has some advantages there. So we're going to go ahead and get started with that fly. And you know, here towards Bozeman, um, the brown drakes are a little bit smaller. You know, a size, so we're typically seeing a size 12, um, where I'm using size 12 2x um, hook. You know, down on the, the ranch at Henry's Fork. 
we're typically using a size 10 2x long hook. Um, the thread here I'm going to use is a uh, 8 aught tan thread and we're just going to wind a little bit on there and we're going to tie in a shuck of Antron, spooled Antron. This is just a medium brown. And we're just going to tie that in just like that, leave it sitting right there. I'm going to grab some of our flexi floss, this brown flexi floss, and we're going to go ahead and kind of tie that in as well. Just like that. And at the same time, I'm also going to put some dub a body. Um, or dub our abdomen all kind of in one whoops you always want to watch that don't let the stuff get all hung up there I took my eye off the ball so we're just going to dub our bleached possum again you can use any kind of dan uh, brown or excuse me tan uh, fur to do this I do like using, you know, we use a lot of natural dubbings. Um, we do prefer that as opposed to some of the synthetics. I think they tend to hold uh, fly flow a little. So we're just going to go ahead and wind that back there, wind our body forward, and we're going to dub that abdomen about halfway up the shank. And dub just a little bit more on there. Possum has a little guard hairs in it, so we're just going to cut. Well, we're just going to cut that out. So then we're just going to wind our flex. Just like that. I'm going to trim the shock about maybe the length of the abdomen, maybe just a tad shorter. So the next step, we're going to take a size 10 grizzly and brown hackle, this being a little bit longer of a hook, using a slightly larger hackle, gives you a little bit, it looks a little bit um, better proportionally. You don't want to go too big. But a size, you know, so if I'm using a size, this is a size uh, 12 2x long hook, I'm going to use a size 10 hackle. And we're just going to pull that, those fibers, like that. Like I said, when we Tie that in, we're going to want to tie that in perpendicular to the hook. Okay. I'm going to grab a little bit of more of this dubbing here and dub a little thorax. Which we're going to use to wind the hackle over. It gives a little bit more support. Makes the hackle turn out just a little bit nicer. Again, it also you know, dubbing absorbs fly floatant, so it's going to help that fly float just a little bit better as opposed to just having nothing underneath the thorax. Okay. But when I tie that in, of space in front of the thorax, because we're going to put in. Um, a little bit of EP5. So we're just going to take about four turns of each on here. Maybe 
just like that. I've got a few kind of crazy fibers there. I'm just going to trim them out. So pull that. Good. At this point, I'm just going to tie in some EP fibers. Like I said, I like to put the, we like to put the EP fibers on in there because it, it gives a little bit of sparkle. Also, in some light conditions, it allows you to see the fly just that much better. And when I tie these in, I'm just going to take the thread and actually fold them over, fold the EP fibers over like that. We don't want to use too much. I mean, this is going to add some bulk to the to the front of this fly. So just a little bit there, just to kind of give us that sparkle. I'm going to take that those EP fiber and just kind of spread spread over top the entire top of the fly. And then finally, I've just got a hen saddle feather here that is like a grizzly dyed straw. And we're just going to, again, tie it in like our hackle. We're going to tie it in perpendicular to the hook. And when I tie this in, I'm going to tie it in so that the, by the, the, the base of the feather, the stem, the so that when I start tying, I'm using the strongest portion of the feather to tie, uh, to wind on. I mean, you can tie from the tip. A lot of times it makes it easier when, you're, when you are uh, folding, ha folding something, but you, know, you can break that pretty easily. So we're just going to use the base of the feather to tie it in, like that, I'll trim it. So I'm going to grab that a little bit. And one thing you can do is just kind of wet your fingers a little bit. And this, so I'm tying with two. So I'm tying with two size 10 hackles. With this, uh, this feather here, I actually measured it about a size 8. So it's actually just going to be a tad longer than the hackles themselves. And that stuff on there. I'm going to stroke that back as I go forward. So I've got it close to the eye. You can see that's pretty darn close. I'm just going to take one, two turns there and secure it. And then I'm actually just going to pull that all back, tie a little bit of a head there. And then we're just going to whip finish. Okay. So last little step here is we're going to take a portion of that end back, end saddle, tie that off. We're going to look at our EP fibers here and cut them to just about the same length as that um, soft tackle, spread them around a little bit, and then we're going to do a little trimming. We're actually going to trim the bottom of this flap. So I'm going to look at that. I'm just going to trim that flap there so it rides nice in the water, lands nice and soft. Clean up any guard hairs we might have sticking out, wild fibers, so forth. Kind of fluff that wing up. There we go. And there we go. There's our brown drape soft tackle merger, just like that. So I'm going to hand it over to Dan, who's going to be demonstrating our last fly. and. Um, just give us a second here to change seats. Okay, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, the 
tying so far. We just have one more fly here to, to go through. And this is a fly that, that Doug and I have um, named the midpoint emerger. I'm just going to go ahead and walk through the fly. You know, as Doug was talking about um, Paul Brown, so Paul liked to use a lot of a lot of soft tackles <clears throat> during mayfly emergences. The soft tackles are a real pretty fly and a real pretty fly to fish, but the one thing that's hard about them is that they are painfully difficult to see on the water, um, and in some cases they are just not real durable. Um, so this is you know, a fly that we kind of came up based on some of Paul. De Paul little cock hackle there through the thorax to help support that fly, make it float better, and add some fullness to the wing. So instead of Paul's fly, what we've done is actually added caribou hair to, for, as, as in sub substitution of the soft tackle. And I've also added uh, some EP fibers or Bex polyfluff in to the wing there just to add a little bit of so you may be asking why are we using why are we using caribou hair on this fly and you know the, the, the thing that we that we like about caribou hair for some of the other types of hair like deer hair or elk hair or, or moose is that it's as you can see a piece here it ranges from you know a tan to done, you know, to dark piece I have, it's just kind of got a, it's real, kind of a fuzzy looking air. Um, it adds a lot of life and movement and character to that fly, kind of mimicking a soft tackle, a floating soft tackle. But the one thing that is vastly superior about this type of a design is you actually can see the fly. I mean, it is durable, it floats well, and you can see it. If you can see your fly, you know, the majority of the and as a result, you're going to fish a heck of a lot better. You're going to, if you see your fly, you're going to miss less fish. I mean, there is a, some real big advantages to being able to see your fly consistently. And having those kinds of traits in our flies is something that we always try to make sure um, that we kind of design into. And we really make sure we, we're fishing flies that are durable and easy to see and that float well. And this fly is all of that. The nice thing about this hair too is it's you know it's got this fuzzy appearance. It's not sterile like deer hair. You know, if you take a piece of deer hair, it's all even, you know, all the tips are straight. This stuff has a real nice fuzzy uh, texture to it. Uh, it's also very, very hollow. I mean if, if you see the side here, you can see, you know, that how that how hollow this hair is. And if you were to to sit here and try to um, push down on you can really so co coincidentally you can tie a greater variety of sizes with a piece of caribou hair than you can with a piece of sparkle done hair you know we often find with, with sparkle done hair a piece of, of sparkle done deer hair you can only tie really one or two good or one or two sizes really really well in contrast caribou hair you can probably tie up to five so you know, I can take the same piece of hair, tie, you know, tie a size 14, and also tie a size, um, in purchasing this stuff, you know, that you don't have to be so worried about the types of fly or size of flies that you're going to be tying. Uh, you know, the, 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 the one downside of caribou hair is it's, it's, unfortunately, it's not really widely available in shops. I mean, it's commonly associated with, with spinning, but as a, it's not really associated with as a, as a winging material. Um, so I hope that, uh, you know, that can maybe change. Um, we think it's an excellent material. It floats well, and it's, above all else, easy to see. So, you know, with that, I'm just going to kind of go through uh, the pattern here. I think I'm going to have to grab a few more materials here, Doug, from you. And would you mind handing me my thread over there? Just bear with us a second. We're kind of... Get a little organized. Okay. So the. Yeah, I will. So the pattern um, I'm going to be tying is going to be the uh, small western green drake or 
or the flab. And this is a mayfly that emerges in late June and uh, early July on the Henry's Fork and, and some other rivers. But you can you know, substitute the dubbing color and really uh, match any type of mayfly. You know, one thing you'll notice here when I tie is that I actually use two pairs of scissors, one in my left hand and one in my right. And you know, I'm really not trying to be Edward Scissor hands here. I'm actually left-handed, but I tie right-handed. And for some operations, I find it more efficient for me to cut with either, with either hand. Um, so that's kind of why I'm doing that. But uh, So our thread tonight, we're just going to use some light olive uh, uni thread. At size, size A dot, okay. Size A dot light uh, uni thread. Oh, excuse me there. Okay. And we are just going to add some um, EP fibers here. Uh, one trick that you have if you're not really tying a lot of saltwater stuff is to just take the EP fibers and take a uh, little cord. What are these uh, strip cords? These zip ties. zip ties. And put it right in the middle of that hunk of uh, uh, material. And it actually is a lot more manageable um, to use. Uh, I've got a, another bag here. This is a similar material called uh, Bex Poly Fluff. It's almost identical to EP fibers. I'm just going to go ahead and, and use that tonight. And I'm going to take out um, probably about, oh, I'd say a couple dozen fibers out of that. And get them out of there. Okay. We okay? We're good? Okay. So I appreciate your patience. We were having a little few technical difficulties while we've been tying tonight. So <laughs> hopefully it hasn't been too much of a pain. So I, yeah, I've just probably got a couple um, dozen fibers there. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to tie it on first, and I'm going to tie it on over top of the eye. Okay. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm going to be tying that wing in last. I'm trying to minimize bulk. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and tie that in. And I'm going to make sure that I've got probably about an eye length there to secure that wing, if you can see that. Okay? A few, take a few wraps there to secure that. Go ahead and place that to the side. And so we're going to be using the same Antron that uh, Doug used on the last slide, but actually in a slightly different color. The NIMS for uh, the small western green drake range from a dark olive to a dark brown. In this case, I'm just decided I'm going to use a dark brown um, trailing shuck here. Uh, you know, we've seen the spooled Antron. This is actually the hairline um, product. And I find that it's actually a little bit stiffer than some of the others. And, you know, if the, 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 it retains its shape just a little bit better than some of the other spooled Antron yarns. And since we're tying a 14, we can kind of get away with just using a full strand here. And one thing I do too is I will like, when I take that off there, is I like to stretch it just a little bit, just to take out some of that metal. Now if you do have to thin this material down a little bit, say if you're tying a size 20, what I would suggest is not trying to rip too many of those fibers out at one time. You know, I would just take a few fibers, you can see them kind of here, to, you know, to the, kind of hanging off the, the edges. I would just start, you know, taking those out. If you try to take out too many fibers at one time, the material ends up just balling up. So I want to try to avoid that. And since we're tying a 14 here, um, we can just get by with using the whole strand. So I'm just going to position that, that thread right behind the tie-in point for the underwing. And I'm just going to take a couple loose wraps. I'm going to slide that right into the position. And what that allows me to do is, you know, I'm not having to fumble around with my scissors trying to cut the material after I've uh, placed that in. So I'm just going to wrap some thread right over top that. And I'm, one thing I'm doing too is I'm ra wrapping fairly tight. And that'll be something, you know, as you tie more flies or get more experience tying, um, you know, you, you can oftentimes take a lot less wraps by using firm pressure. So you want to make sure that you're using, you know, firm pressure when you're, when you're tying uh, your materials in. So I'm just going to kind of work my way back towards the bend of the hook here. And before I do so, I'm going to go ahead and tie in my body material. And for that, we're just going to be using some uh, dyed 
uh, beaver dubbing. You know, um, I probably find that I use uh, beaver dubbing for probably, gosh, at least 60 or 70 percent of all my dry flies. I, you know, and it's it is a really nice, fine um, dubbing material. And one thing I try to do too is I, if I can, I, I like to avoid using wax. Um, you know, I find that if I'm using wax for on my flies, I'm using uh, not suitable for the type of fly I'm tying. And if you're also using dubbing wax and dubbing sparkly Antron type uh, dubbing, it also can add uh, a little dullness to the uh, to the body itself. So I want you know if I'm tying with with a, an Antron uh, fiber dubbing, I want to make sure that that stays bright. I like so I like to avoid using dubbing wax uh, when I'm doing that. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and pull a, a medium olive. And you know, one thing I'm, that I'm, when I'm looking at, uh, when I'm looking through, uh, you know, the dubbing, I want to make sure that I that I buy or select beaver dubbing that has minimal guard hairs. You know, I don't want to be sitting there picking through uh, the the uh, the dubbing, trying to uh, get those out of there. And then one thing I also like to do is just kind of disorient the fibers a little bit like this. I just find it makes it a little easier for me to dub. Okay, so I've kind of guard hairs out and if you know if, if you have to cut them out after you, after you double fly that's okay too but uh, anyhow so back to the fly I'm just going to go ahead and dub a thin noodle for the body I'm just going to work my way down the thread So if I have to add a little bit later on, um, that'll be okay. I'm just going to kind of keep it nice and, and even and smooth. And you know, the reason why I, you can see I've got a little bit of bare thread and I just find that if I can use that bare thread to kind of work back and kind of secure the end of the tail, it, it saves me from having to stick around with, oh, it's, you know, adjusting my dubbing back and forth. Wrap the, this thread right back and I'm wrapping tight so I mean this 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 tail is not going to go anywhere you know there's a um, if you wrap tight and have good thread pressure you can get a, you know you can get a buy with less desirable techniques I mean the the, the the best technique here would be to probably wrap the, the the entire shank with thread to secure the materials because you know the hook is it's it's um, shiny and it's slippery and it's it's it can be sometimes hard to hold materials but since I'm using pretty firm pressure I can kind of get by with not doing that okay so on um, the dummy material up the shank of the hook to form the body just like that and once I kind of get to the two-thirds position on the hook I'll, I'll stop you know I've got a couple guard hairs that uh, kind of just reveal themselves as I wrap that up through there. And then I'll go ahead and, and clip the, uh, the shuck here. And, you know, it's, it's easy to, when you're tying a shuck on a fly, you want it to be anywhere between half the body length or half the shank length to three quarters of the length. I fi find if you, if it, you make it the full length of the shank, it, it, just looks, it just looks a little too long, looks a little odd. So I'm just gonna go ahead and cut it about three quarters of the length of the shank just like that. Okay. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and I've got a, a, a pre-sized hackle, uh, uh, cock hackle. And, you know, the one thing I've done here is I've actually, when I've, when, as I've taken this, this feather, so hopefully, hopefully you can kind of see this. I'm having a hard time seeing it against the contrast. But I've actually kind of removed probably about a half a dozen fibers on that side. And the reason why I've done that is when you take that first wrap of hackle, there's a tendency sometimes for the hackle to kind of cover those fibers so they don't do that. Now, it's not necessarily as big of a deal uh, on this fly because we're gonna actually be wrapping the hackle over top of dubbing. The hackle is gonna kind of uh, sink down into that dubbing pad and it's gonna kind of force uh, the fibers out 
uh, at a perpendicular angle really nicely. So it's not as critical on this fly. I still do it just out of habit. And I'm going to go ahead and, and tie that in. And I've got the, you know, this, the top side of the neck. And the reason why we're tying that forward is because the hackle is going to have a natural tendency to splay back. And with each successive wrap, we're going to have less of a tendency to buy down the previous um, fiber or the, the fibers from the previous wrap. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and tie that in the way that, as Doug was talking about, the way that the hackle wants to be tied in. Just like that, I'm not going to, you know, tie. We would tie it in with the shiny side facing forward to us, and then we would somehow kind of rotate the hackle to get it into the correct position and start winding the hackle. So why not just go ahead and, and tie it in that position to begin with, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go ahead and just tie that in. I want that stem just a little bit long. I'm going to go ahead and. And I'm just going to add just a, just a hair more dubbing to that thorax. Just a hair. Okay. So, you know, not only is the hackle going to, you know, help the fly uh, float a little bit better. It's going to add fullness to, the, to this wing, force the wing in this case to stay upright. So we're going to take at least, in this size 14, we're going to take at least six turns of hackle, um, maybe eight. Pretty tight against that, that light. Unlike Doug, I still prefer to use a pair of hackle pliers. So I'm just going to kind of take the hackle and kind of openly wind that up the thorax. Right up to the end. We don't want to try to try to force that wing down. You can kind of see as I got up towards the end that, that wing the, the under wing just kind of dipped down just a little bit. That's when I know it's time to stop uh, wrapping that hackle. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to Point the hackle right at me like this, and I'm going to take a wrap of thread. And you see, what I did is actually with this towards the rear of that tie-in point. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing like that. Okay, that way we're getting that that material tied right against the base of that underwing. That makes sense. I'm actually going to do one more just because. I'm on camera and I hope that that feather does not pull out. <laughs> <laughs> but I usually only take two, or, or clipping a hackle. And one thing you can do is you can take your index finger or, or um, your middle finger and kind of lift the thread out of the way. So when you cut the, 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 um, the leftover hackler, you have less of a, a, a chance of actually cutting your thread. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take a risk and just go ahead and cut it. Which maybe I maybe I won't do that. that. Okay. One more. I've got a few stray fibers here. Okay. So you know I've still got you can see I've still got about an eye length there. And with that uh, leftover space, we're actually going to use that point to, to tie in uh, the wing material. Okay, and I'm going to leave this these uh, EP fibers make it easier to trim once we tie in that in that wing. Okay, and you can see why I didn't tie in those EP fibers. Now, if I were to tie that in now, I'd have a really a lot of bulk there, right at the, the top end of that fly, where I'd have to tie in uh, in in that wing right on top of that. So with, you know, tying it in first and kind of f folding it back, forcing it back, it really helps to uh, minimize bulk of the head. And if I can always uh, do that on a fly, I generally tr try to do that. It just makes for a nice. Okay, so now we're going to get to the wing part of this fly. And I'm going to take a piece of 
This is just caribou hair, and this is a dark, uh, a darker done piece of caribou hair. And you know, the one thing I do like about using uh, the darker shades, I mean, you could use you could use any of these the, the, these tans or or the, the the medium done pieces I have here, but a lot of times when we're fishing a flab hatch, the best hatches are going to be during, and you often get that that weird flat dark light, and if you have a dark wing against that flat light it makes the fly tremendously easier to see so in this case i'm gonna i'm going to use a piece of uh, caribou hair it's actually uh, a pretty dark done here uh, for the wing for that and what i'm going to do and i'm not, you're not actually going to be able to see this but i'm going to i'm going to put it i usually keep the hair down on my thigh and i'm just going to kind of cut way up the piece of, of hair you know you want to be in there cutting willy-nilly and stuff like that you're going to you know, really, you know, lose a lot of, of material if you do that. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, cut a, a, some of that out of there, and I'll kind of go over the little bit of the how much I've uh, pulled out here in a minute. And what I'll do is, is you can kind of see that there's some, you know, loose fibers and so forth like that, short fibers. And what you can also use the points of your scissors and go through it like that. I just find it much uh, a little faster and easier if I just use my comb here. And you can kind of see those short fibers kind of flipping out of there. Okay. So that's about it's. If I were to take that uh, that wing and kind of compress it down, it's about the same size as the gap was hook, and that's about going to be about the right amount of material to tie in this wing. You know, if you tie in too much. Uh, the fly will have a, uh, a propensity to kind of, the wing will kind of take over and start to slant back a little bit. And we're trying to, you know, there's, you know, you don't need a whole, a whole lot of, of, of material here to, to fly. And the more material you tie in there, the harder it is to, going to be to, to, to finish that fly off. And the one thing I do, you know, like to do too, is just I'm going to put it in my hair stacker. I've already got it all, all cleaned out, okay? And the one thing I'm going to do, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of demonstrate it here on, on, on the vise, is if you're using hair, you know, all, all hair is going to have, just like our necks here, is, there's going to be a natural curve to it like that, okay? And you can kind of probably see even, even a little bit better on this piece here. It just, it just to the material. All, all materials do. And if you're stacking hair, you, you know, deer hair, uh, caribou hair, uh, elk hair, they're all going to have a natural, a natural sway to them. When I stack this, if I stack it on the side like this, I'm, now it's going to be on the, I'm just demonstrating here on my vise, but if I stack it on the side like this and I rotate it in one direction like this, it will take all the fibers and sway them so they are all going in the same direction. So, and it's not as critical probably on the piece that I have here because they're actually pretty, pretty darn straight, but if you get a piece of hair and it has a lot if you sit here and rotate the stacker like this on the side, it will take all those fibers and kind of line them up and make sure that they're all going in the same direction. Okay? So I'm just going to go ahead and, and stack, stack my wing here. Kind of off camera. You're just going to have to take my word for it. I'm, I am stacking the hair. So you can kind of see right now that all of the material, it's going, it's kind of swayed in one direction, like that. Kind of going all in one direction, okay? Like I said, this piece is pretty straight, so you don't have to worry about it too much, but all of the, the, all of the material is going in one direction. Okay. So there we go, okay? So I like it to be, probably a little bit longer than the actual body, okay? Kind of going back towards the, the shuck there, okay? So I'm just going to measure that like so. Yeah. My background is having a hard time with it. Like that. I'm going to transfer it into my left hand before I tie it in. Okay, and the reason why I like to do that is I find if I can trim 
the material before I tie in <clears throat> try, tie it in I actually get a lot cleaner fly and I'm not having to fumble around tr trimming the, the head or um, or any of those kind of things I'm worrying about wild hairs I'm just gonna go ahead and, and trim it right now I'm gonna put a fairly small head on this fly anyways and I find if I trim it first a lot easier for me to 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 do that okay so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take I've got the Okay, we're good. We're good. We might have to have a beer after this, I think, you know? Okay, so I'm just going to take my left hand, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to stroke it back. I'm going to take this, I'm going to stroke all that material right out of the way, okay? So now I don't have to worry about any of those fibers from the poly fluff or the hackle getting in the way of tying down this wing, okay? So I'm, I'm going to take my thread here, and I'm just going to take, I'm going to go ahead and take another wrap there, and just wrap right over the butt ends of that. Okay, and I'm going to take some pretty darn tight wraps, just like that. Okay, I'm going to take one more wrap. I usually when I get uh, tie in a wing like this, a lot of times I'd like to take a few locking um, wraps right ahead of the material. And I've got a few stray hackle fibers there I'm going to go ahead and trim out of there. And then we're going to whip finish the fly. And I'm going to, uh, it looks kind of a little ratty right now, but I promise you it will look, look pretty nice when we get finished. Four terms for the whip finish. Doesn't need much more than that. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is, is hopefully I can try to do this uh, in the vise. But normally what I'll do is I'll take, the, at this point, take the fly out, um, and I like to look at it down towards the floor because I can see I, there's a pretty strong contrast, especially if you're tying in the evening. It's all dark below uh, around your thighs, and it really may, helps to – I'm just going to go ahead and, and, uh, and do my trimming in the vise here. So the first thing I like to do – is actually I'm going to trim this underwing and we're going to just trim it a little bit longer than the body. The body's stopping right there. I'm just going to trim it just a little bit longer than that. Okay. Just like that. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually, again, I would normally take that fly of the vise and do this. But I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, we want this fly to float flush in the water, the bottom of this fly. At this point, I'm having a hard time seeing the fibers with this, this angle. Again, I like to take the fly out to do that. And then lastly, I'm going to take the fly out, and I'm going to actually trim up the head just, just a little bit. Just like that. And this is where having you know some nice scissors come. A couple of loose fibers there. Again, I'm going to... Sorry, I'm going to have to put it down towards the floor. I, I'm going to have to have to give me a little bit of a slack there. Okay, so I've trimmed that that flush. I'm just going to go ahead and manicure the fly, kind of manicure that wing in about 180 degree fashion, and we have a complete midpoint. This fly is, it really has a lot of life. It floats really really well and above all else it is extremely easy to see um, and that's it do you have any any closing thoughts Doug? no we just want to um, yeah zoom out zoom out good that um, and we um, certainly like to thank fins and feathers here Stephen and Tegan for taking care of all these technical difficulties we've been having so we apologize but um, we also want to thank Whiting we also want to thank Whiting and, and Tom for inviting us to do this and we really again hope you enjoyed this and um, we appreciate joining in thank you so much
Hi, Mom. <laughs>